Pensado's Place is brought to you by Avid Vintage King Recording Connection A look into the world of metal. We've got two isotope winners. We're going to do a live drawing from our friends at AEA. Wes Dooley is actually in the house. And we're going to look back at Nashville, right? Oh, yes. Oh, Absolutely. Yes. You're at the place, baby. It's Pensado's place. Yeah. Guys, we're still floating high. Glad to have you with us. Uh, <laughs> we just had, um, for myself personally, and I think Herb and the guys that went with us, just one of the, one of the best moments uh, or weeks we've ever had, right, Herb? Yeah, I think that's, there's no other way to say it, is it? All I can say is whatever you think about Nashville, update it, because it <laughs> it's, not, it's not the place I was last at 20 years ago. It's, yeah, buddy. It's, <laughs> it's the coolest place on earth. Uh, I mean, yeah. Disneyland just should turn into a theme park. Yeah, no well, question. I guess Dolly already did. But. Yeah, yeah, no question. <laughs> <laughs> should we get right to it? Yeah, man. All right, good. Um, hey, everybody, it is great to see you. It's great to be back at the desk. Um, yeah. Although where we were, we sure had a good time. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, likes and subscribes, pretty please. It is the secret sauce. Thank you, Mucho. That is helping us a bunch. Hello to Vintage King, Avid, Recording Connection, and also our friends at Studio 202. Your support right. is most appreciated. For our Nashville sponsors, which are Vintage King, Recording Connection, Audio Technica, and Studio 202, uh, you've had a damn fine week. <laughs> I'll say so <laughs> myself, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, you will. Um, should we recap it a little bit? Let's try. All right. Um, here, here, let me just say this. In your career, guys, all of you out there, you're going to have milestone moments. Um, those are moments that kind of shape your career and they leave a mark on you. I, I'd say Dave and I just had a week of them. Wouldn't yeah, you say? Yeah, I mean, just from legends in real life to legends at the studio, it was just, um, it was, I mean, best you know best fun you could have with your pants on ever it's just really a cool thing <laughs> let me let me let me try to give you a brief brief look at what we did day one we arrive nashville's beautiful uh the p team has a production meeting at puckett's restaurant uh i have my first fried pickle i thought i saw <laughs> jesus <laughs> that's how we started uh day two in the morning it's raining we go to vintage king the facility is ridiculously gorgeous oh, so cool. uh it is run by a truly bad dude named chad evans chevy's there dave does his thing we shoot a cool piece brian is going to edit all that and we'll have that for you in about a week we go off to lunch, uh, pregame meet with Team Pensado and Spitfire Willis uh, for the Belmont <laughs> Q&A. Uh, final planning is extensive. The food at Bricktop is delicious. We'd highly recommend it. And affordable. Uh, and affordable. Stephanie is very pretty, so it's all good, right? <laughs> yeah, Steph's our um, girl. Our team heads over for sound check. Uh, it becomes showtime. We show up at beautiful Belmont University. Oh, wow. But we have a major, major problem. It is storming. There is a tornado watch. Uh, the city of Nashville has literally called off Halloween. It's forcing people to stay in. Kids can't go out for the entire city. Um, I'm looking at Dave going, oh, my God, I think we're screwed. <laughs> but hell no. <laughs> Pensadians are not punks, right? No, I'm in. Uh, Audio folks are tough. The we, Belmont kids showed up. Listen, the Blackbird kids showed up. 400 pe about 400 people from 18 mm -hmm. states and three countries showed up. A bunch in costumes in full-on party mode. Dave and I are greeted with unbelievable amounts of love and affection. We do our thing. Vance Powell, Reed Shippen, Charlie Peacock, and Neil Poe come up. They kill. Absolutely. The prize table is hopping. Uh, we're giving stuff out about every 10 minutes. We sign a bunch of autographs, take pictures, talk with folks. Then we go over to a restaurant near the campus called PM, take over the front of that, and we just fellowship late into the night. <laughs> Day two, uh, we go over to Legend Studio uh, yeah. with the Danny Frizzell. There's a joke there. Uh, this studio is literally hallowed ground where everyone from Waylon Jennings, the Highwaymen, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, up to Jason Aldean and Craig Morton, they've all cut there. Dan has preserved this historic, the, the, the historic bones of the studio, but he's also made it current and kept it relevant. Yeah. Um, 
the piece was so good, I just decided on the spot that that's going to be a whole episode. We'll let you know when we cut that and when we air it. It was just crazy. Then we go off to Blackbird Studios. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. John McBride is... Uh... <sighs> let, let, let me, let me <laughs> just... So um, I would say about as jaw-dropping a recording facility that we've ever seen. I have been in most of the best studios in the world. Dave, you've probably been in more yeah, than me, yeah, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Uh, am I right in calling Blackbird just unbelievable? By a magnitude of 10, unbelievable. It's like, he's got like, any, any mic you name, I think he's got 4,000 of them. Scary. Scary. Like when we, when we were there, Herb, like just six uh, Fairchild showed up. Scary. That he bought. Scary. I think he's got like 70 or 80 V72 mic pre's. So, Precisely. So we just, we're, we think we're going to be there for an hour. We check on the room for the dinner, and then we go speak at Blackbird Academy, which is an incredible, cutting-edge, brilliant learning institution. You're going to hear a lot more about that place from us. Uh, we're in some interesting discussions. Uh, it's right beside the studio that you'll be hearing a lot about. Um, we sign into the, we speak at the Academy. We sign into their Hall of Fame chalkboard alongside names like Tim McGraw and Sheryl Crow. And I, I gotta admit, as I'm signing my name and it's right beside Tim McGraw, I'm, I'm a little impressed with us. I, there was a moment where I went, How'd you get the spot bad. by Tim McGraw? Because I went for the chalk fast. <laughs> <laughs> you were a little slower. I was like, oh hell no, I want the Tim spot. Yeah, but I got the door at Blackbird Academy. Exactly, when you should. So I was like, Herb, Tim, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> we think we're done. And oh, no, we're going to go have lunch with John McBride. Yeah. And it turns out we ended up having lunch at the place. Um, so John comes in, husband of Martina, proprietor of Blackbird, and a frigging force of nature, wouldn't you say? You know what? I don't boy. know why people haven't thought about this before, but John's concept is you know, don't bring anything. Just come make a record. So mm -hmm. you come, you pick out one of a bunch of guitars on the wall several hundred, and then one of them's like a $250,000 Strat. Then you walk into the amp room, you pick out the amp that Brian May actually used on a record. Then mm -hmm. you go upstairs and get drums. And then you make a record with an incredible staff. And gosh, it was, it it was like, I've never seen such excess. And, and the, the beauty of it is John at his heart is an engineer in his bones. Yeah. And so he takes us on a personal tour. Uh, my, as Dave said, my collections for the gods, any equipment or instrumentation that you could possibly dream up, echo chamber rooms with ceilings that move up and down and adjust. The attention to detail mm -hmm. at Blackbird Studio is insane. I'm talking about like everything. It. Room mm -hmm. treatments, consoles, speakers, customer service, even the power supply is custom. Oh, Herb, tell me about the 5-1 the stuff we listen Get ready to. to. Um, we're hearing stories about musical superstars. If you, if you just want to go to their site and look at their client list, and John is telling us stories about all that stuff um, in the facility, it was, just, it was just insane. We probably stayed there three or four hours, I would say, on the tour. Correct, maybe more than that. And the, the cool part is John is just as enthusiastic as somebody who's recording for the first day. And I'm telling you, that passion was incredible. We ended the tour with John putting us in this 5.1 room that is bananas. Um, and he plays us unreleased mixes of Michael Jackson's Thriller and 5.1 mixes. We listen to Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody and finally the Beatles, which is a very important group to yeah. John. Mick Zasky mixed it. Really and incredible. I would say that Dave and I and the group that was with us are in full-on audio nirvana, and we have full-on audio wood. <laughs> when you, when you say. And that wasn't even the end of the trip. It wasn't the end of the trip. <laughs> it was day two. <laughs> so... So we have something else to do that we night. Need, we need to make the intro a two-parter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, then we leave. We're just blown away. The treatment is incredible. Friday night, uh, we shoot uh, at Stephanie and John Willis's beautiful home. There's a party that they have for us. Probably 100 folks in the musical community come out to meet Dave and I. Everybody gracious, everybody professional, everybody wonderful. John's room is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, they brought me moonshine with apples and cinnamon sticks, and I chugged that stuff, and there's a picture around, and I had a good time, <laughs> to say the least. I, I missed that. Yeah, because you were downstairs working. <laughs> it's time for me to party. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ed Carl Tatz put his foot in that room. It's oh, really, yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. great yeah. room. And John is just amazing. You name it, he's got 
If it, if this has strings, he's got one on the wall. Yeah, he's he, bad boy. So that's Friday night. Uh, Saturday, uh, big day. It's the big dinner. Uh, I meet with the team in the morning. We prep. I'm a little nervous. We go home and prepare. It's dinner time. We show up. It is a stunning room, beautifully laid out. It looks like NBC is shooting in there. And we meet, eat, and converse with 18 of country music's best. Like, really great, smart, funny people, fine food and wine, and even better discussion. Now, to a person, each person then came up privately to tell Dave and I, how much they enjoyed the evening and thought it was important to do. And um, I was pretty proud of us for, for pulling yeah. it off. Wouldn't you think? Yeah, you know, like, like the old Nashville uh, would take a little bit of time to, to break into their trust level. Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and we were so blessed. They just opened their hearts, opened their yeah. homes. Yeah, we, um, were, we were really embraced. Yeah, um, and, and when I looked around, we, we were set up kind of like a horseshoe and Herb and I were sitting at the mouth open part of the horseshoe facing the guests and I looked across that and surveyed it and over to my left is Martina McBride all the way to Ed C on my right and Herb in the middle it it, it was overwhelming I mean I, yeah. I, I don't get nervous and I got nervous uh, every seat had a killer in it every seat <laughs> every seat every, had a killer except in Justin Niebank's seat he, that seat had Justin Niebank <laughs> in it Niebank. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Dan Huff went out of his way to help yeah, us, absolutely. Dave, you know. Um, yeah, and so you would think the evening's over, but no, it's not over. So John and Martina grab a few of us, take us into a private room, and they play her new record for us. So we're sitting there in the dark. I'm trying to just process all that's going on. Martina's legendary voice is smoking. I'm talking about smoking she on these soul just, covers. Yeah. Like, if you don't know me by now, do wow. right woman, do right man. And she is just killing this. I'm, I'm just beginning to float in the air. And about 10 minutes later, Don Was walks in, who's producing <laughs> the record. He goes, her. Don sashays in. Don I'm sashays sure he in. He walks. Took a selfie of me and him and sent it to his wife. Jimmy. And right, right about that time, I could just couldn't take it anymore. I called a cab and went home, literally. I wonder what happened No, to you. you stayed. You partied like a rock star. I, I thought John was going to arrange like a Beatles reunion next. Like, where, where else, what else could have happened? It <laughs> was, was it the moonshine? Uh, it was, no, the moonshine was the night before. <laughs> okay. Um, it, we're going to show you that special, obviously, during yeah. Thanksgiving week. It's called uh, Nashville Gives Thanks. Um, I will tell you that I think you're going to enjoy it. We want to give a couple quick thanks. Uh, Stephanie and John Willis, amazing, and, and our new family. Mm -hmm. Serious thanks to Scott. I call him Moses. Scott Phillips, who's the general manager for Making the Seas part of Blackbird. We would ask, and he'd make it happen. He's an amazingly bad boy. Yeah. Chad Evans from Vintage King in Nashville, yeah. another monster. To Waves, Isotope, Avid, Vintage King, and McDSP for the goodies. I'm telling you that people were yelling for your products. You made, there was such movement when you gave, we gave all those prizes. Um, I'll tell you another thing, too. I've never been proud of our team. I was about to say that. What you do you didn't, think? Yeah, Brian Peterson, Cole Nystrom, and Ben Levy. Uh, we got more compliments on, yeah. on our staff than, yep. than, than uh, I've ever seen another staff get. On, on point, everything. It yeah. was great. They uh, they made it so easy for us to have fun. They flat brought it. They worked their behinds off. So um, uh, super job team. Ask for allowance now. Dad is very happy. Dad won't stay happy <laughs> long. So just ask for that. So in a couple weeks, Brian Peterson is going to be editing a bunch of stuff. We'll show you bits and pieces of these things. Um, the specials come up in two weeks. It was amazing. And I think we should say this too. And I want to hear what you say to Nashville. Um, one of the things that we've really learned from this is thanks for reminding us that it's about the music. It's first and foremost and always about the music. You add respect, you add passion, you add civility and grace, but it comes down to about the music and you protect it. It was really good to get back in touch with that, don't you think? Yeah. You went down to Nashville saying, Mother, could I have more tea, please? And you came back. Y'all got in that? Y'all got in that sweet tea? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That's, that's absolutely true. And I intend. Do mo mother for the crowd. <laughs> no, I can't do it. Right <laughs> I have I have campaigns to do. It's my favorite thing you do. We have more to talk Send about. Send your request to five 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 one two one two. Uh, it was a great time. It had was. By all. Let's get to Isotope. I'm ready. We didn't get a chance to do winners last week. We're going to do it this week. We're going to spin twice. Here we go. Let's see what they're going to win. Do it, man. Ooh. Oh. Stuck. 
God, did they win both of them, or do we have to spin again? I think I think he won uh, uh, judges. Um, Your call. Mixed Master Bundle. Okay. Mix and Master Suite. All right, so the first winner is the Mixed Master Bundle. Who is the first winner? Well, if this person is from Italy, it's Ville V. <laughs> if she's from America, she's Vile V. What if she's not a she? Then she's... Um, Ville V. You know, it might be a guy. Yeah, it might be. Wh whatever it is, man, you're one lucky person. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and if you're, if you're non-gender specific, you're in great shape. Absolutely. <laughs> this is the plug-in for you. <laughs> so let's spin again. <laughs> is it safe? It is absolutely safe. Ooh, the last spin of the Isotope campaign, and it comes up to, ah, what is this? Stutter Edit, BT. Oh, I use that cool. all the time. Good stuff? Yeah. yeah. I use it all the time. All right. Well, if you're from Europe, Matt Mullen, you won. If you're from America, Matt Mullen, you won. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations <laughs> to Matt and Viley Vili. <laughs> All right. Viley. I guess it is Viley. Uh, it's something. Who knows I apologize. What it is. I apologize. Good deal. We are here with a great friend of the show. Uh, our buddy Wes Dooley has been a fan and a friend and good friends with you for a long time. Yeah, right? Wes, uh, I've said it many times. Wes is my hero. I love Wes. Um, we do, too. He always treats us with... Extraordinary respect. I, I learn stuff just by being within 20 feet of him. I, I, I don't have to go to his website. I don't have to read his papers. <laughs> just I don't have to ask him any questions. It's the weirdest thing. And I, I now look jaunty in a top hat. And I never did before. <laughs> so true. it's a very cool thing. Um, we've had a great response. Thank you very much to the campaign that they we've put together for AEA. Um, uh, your responses have been uh, uh, several thousand, actually, which mm -hmm. is fabulous. Um, this is a company that is just a high-end boutique company. They really care about their craft. Um, and so I think we should pick some winners. What do you think? Let's do it. Let's get Am in I the eligible? hat. Wes, good to see you. Welcome. A pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here. Usually we're sitting some at some convention or I something and stuff, right? Yeah, the AES. So, what, we, what are we drawing first, Dave? We're drawing first on the, what are we drawing? The, the SMT? SMT, yeah. SMT. All right, guys, here Stereo we go. Stereo mic template. There we go. Okay, okay, somewhere in here is a winner. Is There's a one winner. folded up real nice, that's me. Ah, now I like this one, Oliver Romero. Ah, Oliver, Oliver Romero. Romero, winner. All right, let's that's give Oliver a hand. Europe. Tell him what he won. What, what, tell him a little bit about it. Well, I've never used it, but uh, mainly because I don't get to mic that much, I mix, but the SMT, is a, a system where you can hook up some stereo. Why am I doing this? Wes should be doing this. Well, it's, it's to hook up stereo mics. It keeps them phased right west. And it's kind of like the right kind of distance apart. It's your basic, I want to do stereo with two mics. I only want to deal with one stand. Mm -hmm. And I don't want something so heavy that the whole thing wants to fall over. Ah. All the practical things that if you do this for years, and I've been doing this now for 50 years. Wow. Uh, you start making tools for yourself to make your life easier. Yeah. Makes so sense. Um, this is one of our tools to make life easier. Oh, good deal. I see it in every studio. Good deal. All right, time for the second one. I'm going to mark this so we make sure we get it to the right guy. Wes, mm -hmm. dig in there, and we're going to do the RPQ 500. This is a nice piece. Okay. Here it comes. Nick. Battlestone. Nick Battlestone. Or Battystone. Wow. Battlestone. I'm not quite sure. Let's see. Well, let's. I think you got it right. Nick Battlestone is the winner, and he's the winner of the RPQ 500. Tell Nick. us about it, Wes. Uh, an RPQ 500 was one of these. And that's a 500 lunchbox module with all the EQ you want for ribbons. And as people like Sean Murphy, John Williams, engineer, said, yeah, but it's also really good for room mics or for the main orchestra. And then lots of gain because this is for everything you want to do from something really hot and close mm -hmm. to really back aways from a acoustic guitar. Mm. I like the variable low cut filter that, that, that can kind of tame the proximity effect sometimes on some mics too. And it's variable, that's what I like about it. Well, it's all the EQ that we found people needed and nothing more mm -hmm. because the whole job we, we have is to hand you a tool that makes it really easy to do things and doesn't get you into trouble. Uh huh. Makes so sense. we have a really nice low cut filter here that you can bypass entirely and just listen, does it sound better with or without? Yep. And it takes it down 20 dB and then stops because I don't want to get rid of bass. I like bass. Right. But I want to tame it. Right. 
and especially when you're working with mics at a distance, any mic that's directional, of course, you get closer and you have more bass. Mm -hmm. I come from radio, I love bass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this is just so you can tame it, make it articulate if you need it, or have full bass. It's a beautiful and the piece other, of gear gives you two knobs that allow you to bring up the top end and to do it in a very smooth way that never sounds edgy, mm -hmm. never makes it annoying, but allows you, if you want a traditional sound, you just have it bypassed. Beautiful. If you don't want the traditional sound and you want a little more of the top, Beautiful. you got it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Nick Battistone is going to have fun with that. I think so. And now for the end. Now, here's what's cool about the end. I had a shot at that. What happened? No, man. You, you, you know, you always cheat. I catch you sneaking into the thing at night in the locker, and then we have, you know, we have the guards on you. I, um, I felt the little sticky stuff you had there, and I exactly. said, when he got rid of it. Exactly. When you shook his hand, you, you couldn't get away from his hand. Right. Uh, the fun part about the N22 is when we were in Nashville, mm -hmm. and, and, John is just such a mic guy. We saw so many mic collections. 1,200 mics. Yep. Uh, he brought up the N22. He we, did. He did. Yeah. He was very, he thought it was a really great piece. And it what was, about VK? I look over there. And, and the Finish King was there too. We were very proud. We, we felt sort of ownership on that because we were in the middle mm -hmm. of the campaign. So let's dig in and give somebody one. What do you think? There you go. Okay. I bet I'm Everybody has one. a chance. Let's see who got it this time. Ricardo. Ah, Montalbom? No. <laughs> Montalbom? <laughs> no, your... we're not going to give him a chance to um, break one of our units. Okay. Bures. B U R R E S S. Ah, I'm not sure Burris. that's how you say it. But... I would think it's probably, I think you're close. Ricardo Burris. I think that's mm -hmm. probably his name, right? Let's give him a round of applause. Ricardo. Ricardo. Enjoy my mic, my friend. You're getting a great. I think you'll like piece. it uh, a whole like lot. It. Yeah. It's really for home studio singer songwriters. It's it's it's, a, it's that was part of your designs that we were thinking about. Well, it started out there. That and the RPQ 500 both started out as we wanted something to give back to the community because mm -hmm. we got a lot of people in Nova Scotia, down in Argentina, up in um, Mamou, Yunus, mm. um, in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. People who do music because that's what they've been doing for generations. That's entertainment. That's right. what you dance to. That's right. And that's what you spend Sunday and evenings on your front porch mm -hmm. or in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. And we wanted tools for these people so that they could have the same sort of quality that we've had in recording studios. And we wanted it to be as easy to use as possible. Mm. So the N22 started out very clearly, if you have more instruments than audio gear and you just have a mic that sounds like what you've been playing for decades mm -hmm. and with your friends and that you know how it sounds, here's your tool that you can just plug into an inbox, anything Digi Design, and it will sound fine. It's phantom powered. Mm -hmm. It's a really well done figure eight, so it holds pattern down to 20 hertz. You can put it right up on a guitar amp, and you can have a drop tune guitar, and it just goes right there into the basement and feels just effortless. Mm. At the same time, you have a top end, really excellent mid range. People oh, keep man. comparing it to a U47 for oh, mid range. Nice. Yeah, nice. And then it just has the traditional roll off. And with a little bit of EQ, yeah, you can make it go way out. Mm -hmm. Goes out to 40K. Wow. wow. So it's everything we knew about how to make a cost-effective, compact, sturdy microphone. <clears throat> you, you know, keep this conversation going. It's kind of like we'll have, let's have a live ITL. Okay, I'm ready. Why don't you post? So I first of all, first of all let's, let's congratulate once again Oliver Romero on the SMT. Uh, Nick Battistone on the RPQ 500, Ricardo Burris on the N22. Um, we'll find ways to get in touch with you. We have your information. We'll get those things to you. you. Know, they ought to all they ought to all meet and get together, and then then they can combine their prizes and have an incredible <laughs> little thing, right? Probably not going to happen. That's just a guess. One quick but, thing before we jump into into some questions for you, Wes. Um, guys, don't let the affordability fool you. There's a great tradition in microphones 
that affordable microphones are some of the best in the world. The Sennheiser 421, right. Shure SM57, Shure SM7. Is, Neumann is, KM84. The KM84 Neumann, uh, RL20, PL20 in my day. Um, so don't let the affordability fool you. This is a world-class microphone. Wes, um, take me through the history of ribbon mics. A, a lot of cats coming along uh, just getting into this and, and coming up in our wonderful profession don't quite understand why ribbon mics are revered. Did it start with the RCA 44? Is that where it all started, kind of? Well, the first design was done by Shakti of Shakti Diodes and Dr. Gerlach for Siemens doing a project for Telefunken. And that was for sound for picture because that was where all the money was. That's why everybody was throwing money at it. Not so much for radio, but... But why ribbons as opposed to a diaphragm? Because what they were able to do with a ribbon was have a native figure eight. That wasn't something Shakti and Gerlach did. That was something that when GE bought the patents and then RCA took it over, RCA made this amazing change to having the ribbon open. Now a ribbon is a very thin, 80 millionths of an inch thick piece of aluminum, mm. and it's moving because of the difference in time between when the sound wave hits the front and when it hits the back. And of course, if it hits it from the side, it's the exact the same timing, so the ribbon doesn't move. Uh -huh. And so it had a null at right angles, and then it had a front and a back. Which made an ideal figure eight. And it made a figure eight, and it was the first native directional microphone. And it, since it does that natively, just like condensers natively want to be an omni, mm -hmm. it does that brilliantly. Mm -hmm. The end result is that you suddenly had a microphone that sounded like the music, because RCA had this tradition of just making mics that sounded good in the 30s for the intended purpose. They would take their mic designs after they'd heard it on piano and guitar, voice and flute. And since measuring it was a pain in the ass, we're talking about big room, complex. Why do this if you don't already get to the point where the microphone is what you want for the music? So they were really serving the music. They'd take the hour trip up to the Symphony of the Air and put it up in front. And when it sounded good on all the food groups, from vocals through to percussion, woodwind, strings, and brass, well, then, then it was worth measuring. Mm -hmm. Up to that point, actually, who cares? Mm. And in fact, when you with, say measuring, what are you talking about? Well, they had rooms that they'd get into that were. Anachroic. Anachroic. No, they, they had these giant, you know, this tall sp spheres kind of, you well, know, this shape, an arrow shape, mm -hmm. and then they'd put another one, and this was totally absorbent. And they had to be really deep. As I said, this was a pain in the ass room to do. <laughs> and then you would measure it and measure it in different directions and everything. But measurements don't tell you how does it sound? So they just take the hour up, have a nice dinner in New York, and then they'd listen to it. And when it sounded good, when you walked back and forth from a control room to listening to the live music, then you had a microphone that was worth measuring. And that's what we did, in fact, with the N22. We didn't do any measurements. We just went for, OK, how can we make a microphone that in your studio, your voice your guitar sounds great. Wes, I could talk to you all day, my friend. But let me ask you one last question. Give me some pointers on how to match a microphone with the mic preamp. It's not, it's not a science as much as it is an art form to match them up correctly. Is there some kind of formula that, that we can use for that besides our ears? Well, That's the your best ears thing. are always best. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, if it it's sounds simple. good, it is good. Yeah. yeah. But. The things that are going on there is your mic preamp needs gain, and some mic preamps change their sound character as you go for more gain. So you're listening to that to see if you have a match. Mm -hmm. And then there's impedance. That's the big daddy of them all. And the impedance, and they, they 
change how the EQ is for all the dynamic mics. You're talking SM57s, you're talking ribbon mics, any of that stuff. And of course, if the mic impedance is quite low, it can drive a um, you know, 600, 1000 ohm, 1500 ohm, the old traditional impedances, and that works fine. And that usually comes from condenser mics with electronics. Mm. Some people think you should never use a tube mic preamp with a tube mic, and some people think that, you, and vice versa, you should mix it up. Tube to, to, to transistor, transistor to tube. Is that, is that true? I think the most interesting quote I've ever heard on that is a comment by uh, the guy who designs all the soundcraft and Studer stuff in charge of design, mm -hmm. Graham Blythe, founder with Phil Dutteridge of Soundcraft. And he once said, yeah, you do need to mix things up, but he says the things that you mix up are really a matter of how does it sound. His comment was he'd like to use JFETs and bipolar uh, devices in one unit because the combination had a better tone mm -hmm. than if you just used all one or the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me, you throw in terms out there. JFET's a type of transistor that probably most resembles a tube in the yeah. way the electronic characteristics of it are, and then the bipolars are just classic run-the-mill transistors, right, with Right. Mm -hmm. NPN and PMP transistors. That's interesting. Like, like you personally, when you go try to match something up and it's not something you design, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Just try it and listen to it? What I do is I get together with my crew. I work with some really excellent people mm -hmm. from in their 20s to in their 60s. Mm -hmm. And we sit down and first we think about who's going to be using this and what would be really handy for them. In this case, phantom power is a necessity. We need lots of gain. We need something that's small that mic stands don't fall over. The original ones we didn't steal, well, that was 30 ounces. We wanted to weigh about what an SM58 weighs because mic stands don't fall over them. And we go through these sort of things. And then we start actually listening. And once we decide what we like, mm -hmm. then we hand it out to other people and say, well, what do you think? Because you know, we're a small community as audio overall is a small community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why we're not on uh, ABC, NBC, CBS. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Working on it. <laughs> Wes, uh, I could spend the whole day talking to you, my friend, but I just want to say thank you so much for giving these gifts to our audience yeah. and, to, and to being such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful ambassador and ombudsman for the entire industry. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a better industry when you're in it, my Absolutely. friend, and, and I hope to see you for a long, long time. And, and, I, and I want to come hang out at the, at the shop. And, uh, and also, please come see the mic collection Julian sometime. has invited me. I'm definitely yeah. going. And say a, ho a big hello to Sarah, a big hello to Julian. Thanks so much for, for believing us and being a friend. And yeah, we got more to do. Anytime you need us, we're here. Well, you guys are the guys. Okay. We, Thanks, and, you're, and you're the man. So appreciate it. Stay tuned right there. And we'll We'll be back with our guests in just a second. Oh, yes. Great. Thank you, Wes. Guys, I want you to meet my friend Jason Sukoff. Uh, one of the reasons I asked Jason to be on the show, uh, well, one the main reason is Cole helped me, but the, uh, <laughs> the other reason is I love his work. Now, if, you, if you're sitting there going, I don't know about a metal guy, stick around. This guy is a classic, world-class musician, could work in any genre he wanted. In fact, I think he did a little a little accordion record not too long ago, and, it, and it, it really sounded great. Jason, welcome, my friend. How are things down in Florida? Hello. Things are very Floridian. <laughs> <laughs> and nice, and it's the perfect time of year here right now, where it's not like 90 degrees every 27 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> no humidity. <laughs> hey, man, uh, I was going to talk a little bit about you starting in your basement and, you know, working with gear that you stole, but... Uh, I think we're going to skip that part for, for, for uh, legal reasons. Okay. Uh, but uh, Audio Hammer, I was looking at some pictures of that today. What an incredible facility. Your, your drum sounds coming out of there are, are really, really cool. In fact, you, 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 you've got some of your drum sounds in a, in a collection, right? Yeah, we just uh, put out an Easy X package with uh, TuneTrack, me and Mark, and this uh, guy from uh, 
I mean, he's either in Sweden or Norway, Daniel Bergstrand, who's awesome, who's done like all the Meshuga recordings and stuff, and he's awesome, and Mark's awesome. Oh, cool. Um, on the, on the uh, Tomorrow Never Comes on the Demon Hunter record, that's one of my favorite records that you've done. Uh, the whole album is incredible. Uh, you recorded, produced, and mixed that record, right? No, I, I just mixed it. Just mixed it? it? Yeah, uh, Aaron Sprinkle tracked it up in, uh, I want to say, Seattle, somewhere around there. Oh, cool. By the way, before I forget, shout out to Mark and Ron and uh, Ayao. Yes. Uh, the guitars on that on that song are so wide, and one of the things I love about your work is um, classic metal, some of the old genres of metal. Um, I had to hunt for things, and, and it was like it was like a food where the spices blend together, so you, you couldn't it, you couldn't taste individual spices. But your work, I I, I hear every little thing in its place. Uh, when I think metal, I think guitars with a lot of low end. I think guitars with extra top. I know you take the presence knob on your PBs and crank them, but give me, give me, pretend like I'm an idiot. I know that's not hard to do. I know I gave you a straight line there. Um, how do you get the guitars wide? Is it stacking? Is it? Um, um, I can tell you on the Demon Hunter, um, I reamped it and I used, uh, I believe, a, a 5150. Two and maybe a Bogner. So there, there was four tracks on that, but just you know, left, right, left, right, just 100, 100, all the way. Um, I actually, uh, I had them sampled into my Kemper, and I used the Kemper on that. I was, I've just been stoked on the Kemper oh, for so long. I saw that when I was in Nashville, man. You have the one that has the power out, or just no? I, I have the. Uh, it's it's the second generation of the one that's kind of toastery looking. Man, what a great concept. It's, I think it's the coolest thing to come out for a guitar in the last 20 years. Like, uh, at least that's what I think. As far as digital processing and stuff, I, everything has kind of seemed the same to me up, up till that. Um, only four tracks of vocals, two left and two right? No, no, guitars. Oh, I mean, guitars, I meant, excuse me. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's only four tracks of guitars? For the rhythms, I mean, you know, if there's melodies and stuff, usually there's anywhere from, you know, one to two tracks, sometimes four, depending on the complexity of it. You know, it, uh -huh. it, it depends varying on, it, uh, you know, the band and how slow it is or what you're going for, really. It, it, does the guitar have any effects on it? It sounds like you're running like a 16th slap or something. No, just left, right, left, right. That's it. Like no I magic. Said, like I said, great job. No effects on those guitars. <laughs> the vocal's always in my face, man. I never lose the vocal. How are you doing that? Is it a function of, I know some EQ. Um, it's, um, I mean, on the Demon Hunter, that, that dude's voice is awesome. I, and however they tracked the vocals were awesome. It was really easy to get a good vocal sound. I mean, that's usually probably the easiest part of everything is the vocal sound for me anyway. It's just, I usually use... Uh, if I haven't tracked it, I'll you know I'll throw a couple of compressors on it, probably the CLA plug-in one, and uh, I'll use the, de the decapitator from Sound Toys. Just put like a little bit of grit in there, you know. Uh huh. I so, love that. So that you, plug it's awesome. You're not using multiple compressors on the vocal, just the one compressor. I sometimes I put two next to each other if if I find that it's not compressed enough on the way in, but if it's you know if it's compressed fairly. You know, if it's tracked with a good amount of compression, I'll probably just use one compressor and then the decapitator and then uh, RDSer. Are, are are heavy metal records supposed to have backgrounds with harmonies? Uh, well, you know, when they're singing and well, yeah, I mean, you, you can't really say they're harmonies. Sometimes, sometimes you'll just I'll like layer four tracks of you know. <clears throat> <laughs> Do that again. <laughs> It scared me. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, uh, so, in the second verse, the the guitars, um, there's kind of an intricate thing going on with the guitars, we, uh, and I love that. Uh, some of them, how do you separate so I can hear those? Is that I know that's a silly question. If somebody asked me that question, I'd say I don't know, just did it. But was there was there um, a method to the madness there? Do you remember the, uh, the guitars there? Not, not really. I mean, the, the Demon Hunter is 
was kind of a, a different type of mix for me because a lot of the stuff was, you know, it's like slower than, you know, like if I was going to do a Black Dolly album. So there's like a lot more room for like low end and, and space. So this it was just the easy mix to come together, I thought, as far as the separate and the guitars and the, the, the melodies and stuff. With, with the guitar melodies, I usually just put a little delay and a little bit of uh, reverb. I don't like, I hate chorus. I never throw chorus on anything unless it's, somebody tracked it with it and they have it as a preference or they want it. Oh, I got you. Um, the, uh, the, the bridge, the section before the solo, the vocal right there, do you remember what you put on that vocal? That vocal just... Probably a uh, Waves doubler and um, it's probably just Echo Farm and a Waves doubler on the, where it says the four voices. It's like the second preset. I always just use that. It works out great. And, you know, just try to kind of put it so it doesn't sound too, you know, weird and doubly. In a genre, any genre that has guitars, drums, and vocals, uh, usually the guitars get a little bit of uh, extra love, and, and that's a good place to start. I love your concept about starting with the drums, and, and for, for a minute I had to kind of think about it when you said the drums are the most important part. And can you explain your concept and why you start with the drums? I just think that if the drum sounds, uh, like in any metal production, if the drum sounds like weak, the rest of the whole album's gonna sound weak. It's like the foundation for the whole. Sonically, I think it's the most important. I, I don't necessarily think the most important part of the whole album, but sonically, yeah, I think yeah. that's gotta sound the best. So you can fit your bass and they're good and, you know, uh, so I think basically the bass, you know, once you get your drum set and get your bass guitar where it's supposed to be, it's it's pretty easy from there. I, uh, when I, when I first listened to that record, I was, had been working on a hip hop thing and Man, the bass did not change. When I went from the hip hop bass to the bass on on Tomorrow Never Comes, the bass so is keep like keep that shit real. <laughs> what? Keep that shit real. <laughs> are, are you sure you're just not ripping off your brother Jason? I, even, I thought his bass it was a little better than yours, but man, it, I listen. It is. <laughs> it was probably all pre-mastered. Beats too. All just <laughs> Whoa! Go. Am I sensing some some brotherly rivalry here? No, I Jordan rules, man. I'm super proud of him, man. I I, I don't know how he he get, even got as far as he did in that industry. It's a it's hard industry to get into. I don't even know how to begin to even know how to break into it. Well, I know how he's succeeding. Early on, he hired an incredible mixer to do his Mary J. Blige mix. Yeah. So. <laughs> Moi. He hired Mary. <laughs> 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 on, uh, on Inception of the End, Trivium, um, I know you got your start with Trivium, and all the records you've made with those guys are a textbook in how to make records, not just metal records, make records, because the reason I chose Tomorrow Never Comes is it's got pop elements to me, it's got oh, yeah. rock elements, it's got 70s elements, but I know it's a modern record, and, and, and um, it... It just has an energy that I, I, I don't know how you got. It's, it's, I'm sure some of it was tracked that way, but... Um, it was just tracked good, and I had a good time mixing it, you know? When you're, when you're having fun mixing something, it's, it's easy. Now, on, 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 on Trivium, um, on uh, Inception of the End, the, the drums are a little more classic metal in the sense that they have a I, little... A, I don't know if I did in, in Inception Bleeding the Skies. Is that the third album? Um, Inception of the End, I, I can't remember. I thought it was the newer one. I think David David Draymond did that. I did the, I produced the first two albums. Oh, okay. Well, it's okay. this, this could be a short show. Uh, <clears throat> See ya. I thought you said you did that yesterday. No. Okay. It was a miscommunication. No, it wasn't. You messed yeah, up. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, how come there's so many genres in metal? I think there's more genres in metal than there are in any other form of music? Uh, you know, there's, I don't know why. I, I think there's just a lot of different uh, levels of, you know, how much musicianship in song. You know, there's like tech metal, and then there's black metal, and there's metalcore, and there's screamo, and there's degent now, which is kind of, to me, like Meshuga plus one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I... There, there's a couple of bands that are really awesome that I that I like that like Animals as Leaders 
does really good in periphery. And, uh, but you know, they're, that, that's like, there's like a lot of, you know, those guys are just, they just shred. So they're, they're awesome. But like, you know, a lot of, there seems to be like a zillion offshoot bands that are, it just sounds very Meshuga y to me. And I think Meshuga does it best. Huh. So, hey, Jason, the, um, with all those sort of subsets um, or, or different divisions of metal, we were talking earlier, and, and it's your sense that radio's playing metal more now than it has before? I mean, definitely more than it was, I'd say, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I, mm -hmm. You know, back when I started listening to metal, it was like a, you had to journey 45 minutes to your indie store to find a CD, and it was like a quest. And, right. You know, the, uh, metal fans are really devoted. You know, they, they, they'll travel across country, fly, you know, to Europe to just go to festivals. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a very, it's a very devoted music and people get very into it that are into it. So it's, you know, that. And, and it's a live thing, right? It's, it's a, it's, it's about seeing the group live and cause you know. Yeah. There's... I mean, obviously the, the bands who are awesome live are going to, you know, survive the longest, I think. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was kind of surprised to hear your thoughts on the loudness wars. Um, I think of metal as just being loud as hell, but yet you still like dynamics. You're not you're not a big proponent of squeezing the life out of everything. Can you expand? Yeah, I'm, I'm scared. I'm like scared of mastering in general. I I work with <laughs> with Alan uh, Alan uh, Dushes most of the time, uh, and uh, we have like a really good relationship, like working back and forth. And you know, it's usually a thing of like I got to make the snare a little bit louder because I know that's going to go away, and the guitars are going to come up, and hopefully the bass stays the same where it's at. You know, it's depending on how loud you want it, but uh, you know, I, I prefer dynamics. How do you get it loud though, without, without taking it to the limit? You just, you just, I mean, you print, you know, I, I try to print as loud as I can without, you know, letting it overload. And uh -huh. I, I try not to compress too much, but like I can send it to my mastering guy in the middle of my mix and be like, Let, let's see how this is going to come out mastered. So uh -huh. I kind of have a foresight before it's over and it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, um, uh, big big fat box of shit by Crop Duster. Uh, if you guys don't know this record, um, Jason had a little time on his hands, which is a rare thing, and so he just, from his heart, just started making some music. And because he's a complete and total idiot, and just has as good a sense of humor as anyone I've ever seen. I like porn. <laughs> this record is like everybody's favorite Jason Sukoff record, among others. And um, give me a little history on that. And, and will I ever get to see uh, Big Box of Doo Doo Part Two? Uh, you know, it, it started with me, me. It's just me and my friend Eric. And Eric wrote like a majority of the lyrics, and he sang some on it. And uh, but we we go in there for like a night and just like bang out a song and in like a night and just had fun with it. You know, it, it was before I was recording a lot, so I just had time to sit around and make music, which was fun. You know, it's, it's what I it's how I started doing all this. So, but as far as doing another album, it's like I'd like to at some point. It's just a matter. Back when I did the first Crotchester, I I feel like music had a little bit more identity. It was easier to kind of mm -hmm. make fun of someone easier. And it's like, if I go making fun of one band, I feel like I'm making fun of like six bands. You don't even know who I'm <laughs> making fun of. <laughs> so um, it's like, I want to do it again at some some point. Uh, I don't want to wait too long because I'll be 59 and dead. <laughs> Not really, but you know, you know um, maybe one day, you know, if, uh, if I feel like there's good stuff to make fun of easily that I could you know, identify and we, we just sit there and if I can get my buddy over here, we just have like, a, if I have like two or three months off to write a record, you know, but it's hard that I, you know, I don't get that time off a lot. So it's, it's, like, it's a matter of time to write and, you know, I don't want to just write something and put it out because people want to hear it and if I rush writing it, it'll suck. Well, when, when you do the record, I'll mix, I'll do one mix free and I'll, I'll take the heaviest song and I'll mix it like a Christina Beyonce mix. That ought to help you out. I like that. Beyonce. <laughs> uh, if you guys haven't done it already, the, explain to me. I want you to go see this video. Tell them where to see it. Uh, the the Doth uh, vocal audition video. You're you're 
you're as funny as anyone I've ever seen on that video. Can, I'm an idiot. Huh? I'm an idiot. Uh, it's a fact. Can you just do a little piece of the first verse for me? Uh, let's see here. What is it? Welcome to hell. They call me Steve. Yeah. Welcome to hell. Okay, come back, come back, audience, come back. That's too funny. It, the whole uh, you guys got to watch this. It's like it's like what what how, what was going on there? Why were you doing that audition? You don't have to audition. It it was more of a joke. Oh. It was, I mean, it was it was for Al's it was for Al's band who you know he, he owns the drum room across the street for Audio Hammer. Oh and, okay. And uh, they were auditioning vocalists for their band Doth at the time, so I just did it as a joke. <laughs> too funny yeah explain reamping for me because a lot of guys in the in the r&b and pop side don't understand the importance of reamping can you tell me when when you do it how you do it and what 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 um special if, equipment you use if if i'm gonna mix an album um i mean it's cool if, if anyone sends me the tones and if i like the tones there i'll keep them but it's i i, I like that I'm, i get a clean di with with all the guitar tracks, preferably tracked through a countryman, and uh, I'm using a Little Labs. It's that PCP distro box. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm using that for all my reamping, and it's basically sending that DI signal back at the right impedance out to like whatever amp you want to plug it into. So I can sit there and mess with whatever I want to as for as long as I want to, as if you know the guitarist was there playing. Uh, and 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 what do you, what? To send the signal from Pro Tools back to a guitar amp and have the impedance match up, what are you using? Is that what you're using the Countryman DI for? Uh, no, I'm using the, the Little Labs. I'll, I'll just like route it out. Uh, oh, okay, you said that. One of my channels and patch it straight into the, the Little Labs and then just come out with a quarter inch jack straight to an amp. And, and on, on the 5150, you like to boost the bass a little bit not too much mid-range and, and boost the presence. You know, I, you know it's, it's. I think it's important to have some mid-range in there, a good amount of mid-range, and, and you know, you can take it away later. But you, I think it's good in there for definition, like a 5150 combined with a tube screamer, or uh, even the JSX or the Triple X. They all sound awesome, and they you know, sometimes you don't even need a tube screamer. You know, it depends on the player and how hard they play. But you know, the tube screamer 5150s just kind of been the standard for like a. A long time. The the green Ibanez tube screamer, that one. Yeah, it's TS TS nine. I want to say. So Cole and I were trying to remember. You used an eight oh eight in a in a metal song. Was it White Chapel that you did that on a bridge or something? Probably. That there's takes probably, balls. There's probably a good amount of bass drops. Not too many though. There was an album that I did that was like a bass drop, like every four measures, and it was ridiculous. <laughs> Um, you said something, um, I can't remember exactly how it went. It was something, you, you have to know that metal is funny, otherwise uh, you're in trouble. I never thought... Oh, it, yeah, it just like don't take, your, don't take metal too seriously. That, that, I mean, I, I love metal, you know, it's like, but I don't, I don't take it seriously like, you know, it's like evil and whatever. And, you know, some, some metal's evil. I, I don't really pay attention much to metal lyrics. I'm, I'm more into the music side of it. I mean, I can tell you when the lyrics are horrible, and I'll tell someone I'll change them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I just think you shouldn't take anything. Obviously, take your job seriously, but, like, don't take, I don't know, crotch, crotch duster. You know, that's my <laughs> view on <of> metal. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I guess I will. I couldn't tell... If you thought Death Magnetic had the worst sounding drums ever or the best sounding drums ever, which is it? Is that the one with the snare drum? That horrible high ending snare sound, yeah. I vote for worse. What do you vote? It, it, it's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's, it still sold a zillion copies. Yeah, no. So I can't really say anything about it. It sold more, sold more albums than any, any album I've ever done. And um, do you cut your records to click tracks? They sound pretty yeah, tight. I, I, we, we, uh, I mean, I prefer if, 
if a drummer can you know, click just because it makes life easier for everyone. I mean, I've always jammed with a drum machine or a click since I was like eight. So it's just kind of like a thing that I'm used to. What's the psychological way to get, some drummers don't like it. Do you play them like a, like a, like a high hat, a real high hat part instead of a, you know, instead we of We actually a... haven't had a drummer yet that, that hasn't like been able to use a click. And if, you know, if there was, then we got one that could play with a click. <laughs> and, and I love this. I love someone asked you about how you got the kick drum and the bass to work. And you said, well, you automate the hamburger out of your kick drum. That's right. What you the hell does that mean? Right out of it. What does that mean? Tell me. I mean, just automate the hell out of it. You know, it's it basically, you know, depending on the speed of the song and if you got like tons and tons of just like going and you want to be able to hear the bass, you know, obviously if your kick's just going like, but that, but that, but that, but that, but then, you know, if it starts going, you know, the bass guitar is going to get crushed in two seconds. So you got to, you know, you can either bring your kick drum to like, you know, like a dB and a half or two dB down, depending on the speed. But it's also cool to put like a, just like a, a regular DigiDesign like EQ1 plugin uh -huh. and roll it up to like 44 hertz uh -huh. and, and automate that so that the, like the low, low end of the kick drum doesn't like squash the bass. So we, it's like a combination of sometimes that'll work. It, it depends. Sometimes you got to do both. Sometimes you can get away with just one. That's pretty cool. In, in my world, I usually only have two things fighting for the space down there at the bottom, but you've got three things. You've got the guitar, the kick drum, and the bass. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I put I put a good amount of load in the guitars, but I, I like to leave a good amount of room for the bass. I I, I think bass is an album, or an album, an instrument that gets lost a lot in in metal, but I think bass is pretty important. And I think it's one of the instruments, too, that people... It's like one of those things. If you don't have a like a really good sounding bass, then it's just not going to sound good. On um, job for a cowboy on on nourishment. That's another record of yours. I think spectacular. Um, can you take me through the process on that song? It was it was there. It, it, it felt to me like that mix was. I don't know that you'd have to show me it. I don't know the song. I, I only know the fake names of the songs that they came here with before we got it mastered. <laughs> oh. They're all called like. Like Katrina three or like Stephen Dave take a shit two or something. <laughs> that's, that's, that's that that's was it. That was it. Back. The Katrina thing. Well, you know what? The, the the record top to bottom has your has your personality in it. Um, in terms of that particular record, was there anything unique about the way you got the low end to work? Because it, it it's, if if it's the second one that we're talking about, nurse, there two oh yeah, it's the newest one. The one that just came out uh, 11, 2011. Uh, yeah, um, that it was actually a different situation than the first album because their bass player now, Nick, plays with his fingers and he's like, he's super good. I tried to get, I think the bass on that album was like probably as loud as I could like ever get it, but I wanted to kind of keep the, you know, the twang in it too. And it was super technical. So it was kind of like sometimes it's, you know, it's riding under, under the guitars and sometimes it's following the guitars. So it's, oh. it's, it's like anything else. You just got to find the place and, and everything between the kick drum and the bass guitar, that's really the, the hardest part of, of any album, I, I'd say that, when I work on it. And then once I figure that out, it's, it's pretty much smooth sailing from there. You know, just a shit ton of automation. Are, are you using, uh, oh, oh, uh, before we go to Batter's Box, uh, the song I like during the, um, right before the second verse, the whole right side of the, of the mix just goes silent. And then a couple of times during the song, the whole right side of the mix just gets silent. It's 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 an effect I'm gonna have to steal, by the way. Without the, the little the little radio cutoffs. Yeah, the, only the, one of the three tricks I know I use on every album. <laughs> well, it's all about yeah. the the, the lo-fi cutoff, and then, you know now it's you, you drop some dub stuff in there, and it's and then it's now. <laughs> DP, why don't we uh, tee up your arm and get to batter's box? What do you think? Let's do it. Let's do it. All righty. So uh, I've never gone head to head with someone with his talent. I might be in trouble, her. Fire away, sir. Uh, vocal growl, or like one guy said, vigorous vocals. Vigorous vocals. First thing that comes to mind. 
how you crew topsy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, just give me a plug in or a, a, a piece of outboard gear. Well, this would be a piece of outboard gear. Well, maybe not. Guitar amp. Guitar amp, fifty one fifty. Cool. Uh, bass. Uh, Ibanez SG or uh, or Fender P bass. Direct guitar. Countryman. Stereo bus. Alan Smart. Drum pre, uh, drum preamps. API and uh, Vintec or Neve if it's available. <laughs> cool. Guitar pedal. Guitar pedal. I'm crippled. I'm not allowed to do pedals. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I had a GT5 once. Uh, tube screamer. <laughs> I'm crippled. Man, you ought to be a stand up comedian. I should. I bum, bum. Bum. That's my joke for the day. Um, guitar compressor. Guitar compressor. Don't use them. Really? Yeah. Uh, that's a headline. I'm scared. I'm scared of compressing guitars. Should I not compress guitars? I don't know, dude. Do you feel good when you compress them? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. If you feel good when you compress them, you should compress them. I just, when I compress guitars, I, I feel sad. I like, a, I like the orange squeezer. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Uh, the cheapest gear you used on a successful record? Uh, I don't know about cheapest, but let's say qu quickest. Uh, my fav uh, favorite was probably mixed with the JFAC Ruination. And I, I just, uh, I think I mixed that whole album in like three days because it had to be mixed real fast. But I think it was one of the best that uh, sounding ones that I've done, but I, I don't, I can't think of anything I did on cheap stuff that was successful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to give, I'm going to give me that point. Uh, converters. Uh, links. Oh, mm. overheads. Uh, 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 Neumann KM uh, 184s. By the way, I love your cymbal sounds, especially your ride cymbals. Uh, they, island plug-in. Island plug-in. Oh, uh, uh, Waves SSLE channel. Oh, good choice. Com yeah. Compression and EQ and gate. My man's smart. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did, did I win her? No. His... I just, how about I just bring a signal generator? <laughs> his bat speed is very fast. blast white noise for like four days. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've done it. I kind of like that. Ugh. Hey, uh, Chongor over in Corner Office, good to see you, good sir. Good to see you, man. Uh, I'm sure you've got questions from our audience, who, for, for Jason, you got a few? Yeah, we got some good ones. Fire this away. first one's from Jamie Donnelly. In the metal genre, how do you battle with blending synthetic drum samples with overheads and room mics to get it all to blend together? Um, I try to keep as much as the real toms as I can. I'll blend in tom tom samples but i'll try to use as much as the real toms as i can as far as sam uh snare i blend the snare with the real snare. the only thing that i is usually is the kick drum but i try to use a lot of room mics um in conjunction with you know the overheads uh and i think you know the more room mics that you use you know the less sampley your samples are going to sound if you haven't blended right and everything mm. Mm. Makes so it's, it's just it's it's all a combination of having like a good drum room and just having the right you know extra trip other than just having the samples and just and you want to make sure that they're like aligned perfectly with the sample too like if you just drop them in there like if you were to use sound replacer like it it doesn't line it up right with it you have to actually drag the sample back a little bit to to match it up with the transient so you know that takes a lot of time and I you know I have all do all that stuff for me. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Jason, how do you, if, if this is something you're not comfortable saying, but how often do you actually add samples to your drums? I'd say most of the time. Like, okay. there was a couple, there, there's a couple albums we've done where we didn't use one on the snare. Uh, Bury Your Dead's Beauty and the Breakdown, there was no sample on the snare. And we were going to not use one on the kick, too, but they, they wanted to. And I, I think that's one of the coolest sounding albums that we did. But Mark Castillo just... He kills the drums, man. I mean, when you have a drummer that that hits that hard and 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 sounds, you know, the way he does, it's it's easy to get an awesome drum sound. It's all about the drummer. I mean, if I get a, a performance from a drummer that's, you know, amazing, I mean, most of the time, 
there's gonna be a little bit of samples, but it's you know for for the most part it's you know their drums, you know. Exactly. Cool. Uh, Chongor, another one. Michael Hadalak, could you elaborate on your parallel EQ boosting technique they use on guitars? Basically, it's like yeah, if you're you, let's say you're doing two tracks of guitars, and you have you know whatever you're EQing on the two channels or whatever, you just basically set up two more channels, and uh, you aux out those two channels like right next to it or uh, I'm thinking like a console, but you know, I put my faders right next to it and then I just add EQ and you blend those two channels together. You just, with whatever EQ you, you decide to, you can throw it out of phase and just mess it until you have a sound you like. I, I don't really have a, a particular technique that I do. I just kind of turn lots of shit until it sounds crazy <laughs> and stop when I'm happy. Sean Gore, one more from you. Uh, Michael McDonald's, how does a mic <laughs> From the Doobie Brothers? <laughs> Oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. From Michael McDonald. <laughs> same thing. <laughs> How does the miking technique change when recording drums on a metal song, specifically getting a metal kick drum sound? Um, I don't think that you necessarily like the. There's not like any different technique that I use like between different kick drums. I, an Audix D, I, I believe it's called D4. Uh, you can get great samples from the kick with with that. Just putting it pretty much like, uh, you know, maybe like six inches away from the beater on the inside. And, you know, it's all, it's a combination of tuning and having, it, it's just too many factors. But miking wise, I would just say a D4, and sometimes you can try to like use a condenser, take like a, a TLM 103 or U87 and stick it outside the front head. But, you know, sometimes it winds up picking up too much of the kit and, it's unusable. Are you leaving the front heads on or do you tend to take them off? Sometimes I used to take them off and put weights in them. Um, sometimes what we do now is we, we actually use a, a trigger pad instead of kick drums just, just so that I, the kick drum won't be in the room mics as much in case you know there's like a, like a, a bass part that that's just not making it for some reason. Like this way, the the kick drum won't be all over the room mics and all over the overheads. So if there's any like that's that's one technique we use. If we think that the drums might take a little bit, is we we'll, we'll just use like a like a Roland or like a Yamaha you know, pick pad. And so that way, you know, you're not getting that one drum show up in all the overhead mics, and it works out pretty cool. cool. Hey Jason, uh, a, a couple quick things. One mm -hmm. is. Um, I'm in some discussions about us coming to Florida. Can we stop by and see you maybe and do something at your studio? Of course. Uh, it would be a ball. We'd, we'd love to get your input yeah. on it, and some of our fans would love to see you. Um, secondly, our, one of our little star, star staffers, Cole Nystrom, mm -hmm. when he suggested you, I think last week, stayed on Dave and I like he was going to literally stab us in the back if we didn't make this happen. And, Me and uh, and love. <laughs> he knows every song, every he, record, every group. He everything. loves you, man. In fact, if we have a, we have a sexual connection. Absolutely. I was about to say that because he hangs out at your place with a camera outside your window. So just if you know, he's got he's got a ponytail, so you might confuse him between boy and a girl. He's seeing some pretty sick shit then. Uh, <laughs> he's a metal drummer, and he is thrilled that that this happened. I'm uh, thrilled. Uh, we 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 all are thrilled. Our audience is thrilled. J thanks so much, Jason. We will come back to you and want to do more with you. Is that cool? Of course, man. Thank you so much. Oh, it's our pleasure. Dave, why don't you take us home? I've been listening to a lot of Jason's work this week, and, and I'm telling you, I learned things. I learned things from a lot of different sources, but this cat's the real deal. He, he really, really is inspiring. So check his work out. Um, as always, go back and, 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 and review some of the work of our guests when, when they're on the show. And I'm, I'm promising you're going to pick up a lot of stuff. I really had a blast with Jason, and we'll see you next week.